Do do di. It's Nandi. Hello, friends. I'm back today with another edition of the Dirty Dozen. It's the flagship series that launched my channel in January 2023 and has quickly become my most iconic content. Thank you for all of your support and engagement, which have allowed me to continue making content as a hobby. There will be some newer viewers to the channel who don't know what the Dirty Dozen is. So, a brief explanation. The Dirty Dozen is a collaborative tier list that gives you the top 12 and 30 characters in the game. It ranks them in popular game modes like Guild War, Guild Raid, and a new edition, Horde Mode, which I'll explain later on. At its core, Tacticus is a resource management game where you invest in your characters to hopefully collect more rewards, allowing you in turn to reinvest. Resources are finite, and the idea behind a guide like this is to let you make the most out of your time and investment. These videos are generally targeted at more middle and end game players. If you are just getting started, you're better off looking at my beginner's guide video and focusing on the initial campaign characters. As with all of the Dirty Dozen videos, they also allow me to offer additional things, such as codes and giveaways. For this video, I'll be giving away five prizes of 80 shards for Helbrecht, who was instrumental in success against Magnus the Red. All you have to do to enter is leave a comment below. I'll draw the prizes in two weeks or so and will contact you with instructions on how to claim the prize. Additionally, I have just hit a 14,000 subscriber channel milestone. Thank you to all of you that have supported me. On screen is a code for you to enjoy, and if you haven't done so yet, please hit that subscribe button. More milestones equals more codes, so it's a win-win for everyone. There is a new addition to the scoring matrix for this edition of the Dirty Dozen, Horde Mode. Survival Mode looks to be a recurring feature for Snowprint. First we had the Titus event, and shortly we will have the Azkor event. The mode values traits like creating summons over time, healing, being durable, and being able to kill multiple enemies in one turn. While not identical game modes, there is significant overlap with legendary release events. I love LREs, and a lot of the community do too. It's not always about finding characters that meet a lot of trait requirements on which to base their value. Ethana and Abaddon are examples I often fall back on. The two usually meet many traits, but are terrible at defeating waves of enemies. This is all just a roundabout way of me saying that I have added a Horde score to keep the Dirty Dozen more balanced and reflective of characters that are valuable in Tacticus. How is the overall scoring done? Well, each game mode has a weight applied to its score. 20% for Horde mode, 20% for Guild War, and 60% for Guild Raid. I have arbitrarily picked these weights and left raids at 60%, because at the moment, they give the best rewards in the game by a significant margin. The raid score is an average of all of the character's individual boss scores. With the scoring and new bits out of the way, let's move on to the Dirty Dozen itself. On screen here is the infographic for the overall Dirty Dozen. I'll pause for a minute and let you digest before talking about each character individually. You'll notice many changes from the last edition, and that is just because we have added the new Horde category, which makes some characters a lot more valuable. Sho comes in first, deservedly, because of how well the Tau does in both Horde modes and War. The ability to create recurring, high damage, ranged sniper drones makes him an all-star in legendary release events. If you've ever fought against Sho in War, those same high damage drones make him one of the toughest defenders you can face. Sho also fits into the mechanical team. Since the drones count as mechanical units, it lets you trigger Exeter Rose passive up to four times in a single turn. Tangida is in second place and does well for reasons similar to Sho's. Tangida can summon up to five Skitari summons and also has abilities that potentially let him trigger Exeter Rose over 10 times in a single turn. He loses out to show by being marginally weaker in Horde modes and War. The Chapter Master of the Ultramarines is a solid third place, with abilities that do well no matter what mode you use him in. His Gravis armor and naturally high defensive stats make him excellent in Horde mode. Kalgar's active ability lets you clear out a problematic wave in Horde, or in War enables you to wipe out an entire squad of enemies, especially when paired with Ragnar. 
His passive makes him an excellent buffer for the multi-hit raid team. Exeter Rowe is the linchpin of the mechanical team, widely considered to be the best raid team in the game at the moment. In the last edition of the Dirty Dozen, we were only beginning to explore how much the mech team can be used against more than just a few bosses. Now we know that the mechs are best in slot against the original Tyranids, Sarek, Mortarian, Screamer Killer, Rogel Dorn, and Avatar of Kane. In fact, the only bosses where the mechs aren't strong are against Gazgul and Magnus the Red. I suspect it's only a matter of time until we find something reliable for the latter. Ragnar comes in at number 5 as being the strongest damage dealer for the multi-hit comp. His stock has risen slightly with the release of Magnus the Red, and I have him in many of the top runs I have done. His War Howl is excellent in both Guild Raids and Guild War, and I suspect he will remain in the Dirty Dozen for a long time. Eldrion, once the King of Tacticus and the Dirty Dozen, has fallen to a paltry sixth. He is not usable against the Avatar of Cain, and is terrible against Magnus the Red, which has really hurt his raid score. Eldrion is okay in war, but is ultimately a squishy psyker and doesn't do well in horde modes. Actus comes in next and is probably the weakest of the core three Admex in the mechanical team, but still fulfills an important role within their team. Without Actus, the team certainly functions far less well. The character is a little bit on the squishier side, which makes him slightly less useful than the other Admex. Revas is an interesting one. Technically, she fits into both the mech and multi-hit teams, but isn't the top choice for either. I value her highly for two reasons. Her overwatch is powerful in Guild War, where enemy AI will simply run into the active and die. Revas is also an excellent choice for newer players who are building characters up in general. Her active also means that she is super easy to collect experience for, as she will be killing enemies in Arena all the time, and barely needs any more investment from experience books. As you become more skilled and develop a wider roster, Rivas will probably fall off your teams, but she will still sit in the top defense somewhere for most players. Karn the Betrayer wasn't around the last time we did this, and he's great. I don't think I've ever quite enjoyed playing with a single character as much as I enjoy playing with Karn. His active and passive abilities make him incredibly lethal in a game mode like War. In Guild Raids, Karn is a bit more niche, only really fitting into certain bosses and certain multi-hit teams, but he does a good job there. Bellator doesn't see much play in top-level Guild Raids these days, apart from Gazgul. He's still an acceptable option for lower-level players against the Tyranids, and really against any boss as part of the multi-hit team. Just be aware that he fades away compared to other characters in the endgame. Bellator still remains in the Dirty Dozen because of his fantastic value in Horde modes, where his Gravis armor, summons, and exceptional mobility make him an all-star. Abraxas is the only one from the Psyker team to make it into the top 12, and does so largely on the virtue of his summons. These do a lot of damage when coupled with Abraxas' passive ability and make the Thousand Suns character pretty good in war and horde modes. It hopefully shouldn't need to be said that he is also a linchpin in the Psyker team, and that brings his raid value up too. Rounding out the top 12 is Boss Gulgortz, the newly reworked Orc leader. I might be a bit too optimistic and overestimating Gulgortz, but I like a lot about him and his kit. From a raid perspective, he fits into the multi-hit teams as well as the mech teams, since his passive triggers another instance of Exeter Rose attack. For Horde mode, his passive counts as an extra attack, letting you kill two enemies in one turn. He also fulfills the rare one-hit LRE trait, but with multiple hits from the passive, Gulgortz is pretty good at killing even swarm enemies. His active bringing summons to the table is great for Guild War, as it helps distract the enemy AI, but also gives you some bonus movement and reach to make sure you aren't caught on the back foot. Before we go on to the top 30 characters, I thought I'd take a bit more time and talk about Guild Raid teams. You'll probably recognize this slide from my previous Dirty Dozen video, which talks about each Guild Raid meta team at the moment. The first team is the multi-hit team. This asks you to stack multi-hitters with damage buffers to do lots of damage to enemy bosses. A typical team might look something like this, but you can substitute characters in and out as long as they are either a multi-hitter or a damage buffer. 
the mechanical team centers around exploiting Exeter rule. Each time a mechanical unit, be it character or summon, makes an attack, Exeter rule triggers some out of turn damage. This damage can get out of control pretty quickly, especially when you consider Eldrion and High Ground as potential damage multipliers. The Psyker team is last and asks you to use the Nerothrope as the cornerstone of the team. You build up stacks on a boss, and once the boss is at 15 stacks of Neuroparasite, you give the Neurothrope two hits with Yazagor's active ability and take the high ground for a large amount of damage. I'm telling you this because before I get into the recommendations and rankings for each character, you have to appreciate that using these teams against bosses requires some nuance. Let's use the example of the mechanical team against the guild raid boss Rogal Doran. The Rogal Doran battle tank puts down this area of effect attack every so often, which means that if your units move, it triggers a salvo of damage. The mechanical team is great, only to a certain point, as you need your summons to survive. So while the mech teams are best in slot against lower rarities of Rogal Doran, they will eventually fall off once the summons stop surviving. I could theoretically give you a matrix which tells you which teams are best in slot against what boss rarities, but of the roughly 40,000 of you that watch these videos, it's hard to give you something standardized. I've made an attempt at broadly giving some guidance here with asterisks where you really need to have a high level understanding of the boss in order to make the team work. With that in mind, here are the top 12 raid characters in the game. You'll notice that the mechanical and multi-hit teams dominate the rankings. The Psyker team is fine, but really only excels versus a few bosses, and therefore doesn't do well enough across the board to make it into the top 12. With the top 12s out of the way, let's move on and talk about the rest of the top 30. I won't go into a huge amount of detail about them all, but I will speak about and highlight a few. I really like Anufet. His kit is outdated and he probably needs another look at some point in the rework schedule, but he ticks a lot of boxes. His summons take longer to come online compared to Sho and Tangira, but they are pretty good when they do. Anufet and his summons all have some self-heal, making them valuable in horde modes. Mataneo and Celestine are great, particularly in War versus Sho, but also against other Overwatch characters. Sho has a silly bit of AI which I can tell you about now. Once a character enters melee with Sho, Sho stops thinking and panics, just trying to punch the enemy to death, fairly ineffectually. It's a bit of an odd one, especially as Sho suffers from close combat weakness and should, in theory, want to leave close combat as soon as possible. Engaging him in melee is really the best way to counter the little Tao, because once he leaves melee, he can start summoning his lethal drones again. As is tradition, I try to include some boss strategies in my videos to help people take on the latest raid boss, who can sometimes be challenging. In terms of teams to try, you're either stuck with a straight up multi-hit team or a variant of the mech team that uses Helbrecht, adjacent to Exeter Row. Helbrecht's passive gives the bonus damage to all of Exeter Row's attacks, so in theory, if you are crafty with your positioning and sequencing, you can gain a lot of extra out of turn damage against Magnus with this hybrid team. I've seen it work a few times, but it's pretty challenging to make consistent, especially with how much potential RNG there is on the boss fight. I think Helbrecht is the key to this boss fight, and I recommend farming him up if you want to do well here. I'll walk you through some strategy considerations on this gameplay run of mine. I find the Biovore is well suited here as the Machine of War. On turn 1, I kill off the two enemies on the bridge to free up some movement for the rest of my squad. I'm careful not to attack with Ragnar because I want to preserve the 25% bonus damage for his first hit until the next turn. I'm sure you all know this by now, but Magnus's summons move and attack before he does, so the Biovore does a good job at distracting and manipulating the position of the Terminators and Rubric Marines. On turn 2, I do a double War Howl with Onshi and Ragnar to get a massive damage bonus on Ragnar. Kalgar then runs in and does his active ability, killing a Rubric Marine and heavily injuring the Terminator. Roswitha uses her active to light Magnus on fire, making him take 20% bonus damage. Then, Helbrecht uses his active and gives Ragnar another slight damage boost. Ragnar's attack with all of the crits do almost 200,000 damage here. 
I can't predict if Magnus is going to fly or not, but putting the Biovor spore mine there was my attempt at restricting his movement somewhat. The critical thing about our positioning on turn 2 is that three of our characters benefit from on Shi's damage aura. On turn 3, positioning and turn sequencing is essential. I attack with Helbrecht and Ragnar before moving Kalgar, so that both continue to gain the benefit of Kalgar's passive. Then I move Kalgar and attack with him and Roswitha. I was reasonably confident that Magnus would try and use a fly move on the next turn, so I decided to drop a mine on the other side of the bridge, so that Magnus couldn't fly there. Lo and behold, he does try and fly, but remains within engagement range for the rest of my force. There isn't a huge amount else here. I thought I could figure out some secret trick to his AI that guaranteed some pattern or behaviour, but so far it's been a little bit unpredictable. To that end, the most consistent and reliable damage that I think we can do is a big, massive attack with Ragnar while he is adjacent to Helbrecht and Kalgar. Karn is another alternative to Ragnar, or can be used alongside him, as Karn does 12 hits per turn in the right circumstances. All of those hits can theoretically be buffed if Helbrecht is adjacent. If you want to do well, you will have to use legendary characters here. I know that doesn't feel good, but I haven't been able to replicate semi-decent results with anyone else. A mechanical team with Asmodai might be another middling option if you're desperate. Still, I'm not super high on Asmodai and I would caution the masses in building him over other characters. Okay, that's quite a long video, but the Dirty Dozen only comes around every few months and I wanted to do it right. I'm making a quick recruiting pitch on behalf of my cluster, the Eye of Terror. We have a couple of spots open for competitive players looking to test their metal, and one in particular with the Iron Warriors, currently ranked 4th in guild raids. Drop by if you fancy it. As always, a massive thank you to my Patreons who are slowly growing in number week after week. You are all amazing and you've given me this amazing platform to continue doing my work. Thank you so, so much. Finally, if you are a newer player who hasn't yet used their referral code, I'd love if you could consider entering mine. It earns you 100 Blackstone and supports me in my work. It is single use though, so choose who you support carefully. Bye for now. Doo -doo -dee. It's Nandi!